how do we find that balance between that innovative culture? Because to be innovative, you actually have to take risks. And so I think it's a level where you need to accept that maybe you, you risk 10% or 20% of the business in terms of time or money or something like that, right? So it's, it's, um, you've got to take calculated risks. Um, and I think you've got to, you've got to be, take feedback. I think that's probably one of the things, you know, whenever, like if we launched a new product or did something new, you take a calculated risk and you, you, you're not above feedback. You put it out there, you ask people, does this thing work? Does it solve your problem? And if not, give us a feed, give us feedback and then take that feedback and change. You know, you're not a tree. You can move with things. And I think that's the other thing is that people are probably often have an unwillingness to take feedback or accept that they might've been wrong. Um, so I think if you, if you, if you are willing to accept that you may have been wrong and you're willing to take feedback, then you can enter it, you know, and you can change things. It doesn't, it doesn't have to stay the same way that you thought was a good idea. Welcome to Risk and Rise, the podcast where we explore the journey of overcoming the fear of failure, embracing risk and achieving success in entrepreneurship, creativity and personal growth. I'm your host, Talana Simpson, and I'm thrilled to embark on this journey with you. Together, we'll discover the strategies, insights, and shifts in our thinking and attitudes that are needed to turn setbacks into stepping stones and transform fear into fuel for success. So grab your coffee, get comfortable, and let's dive into today's episode of Risk and Rise. Jonathan Smith was the founder of Payfast and he has gone from being the person who came up with the idea and put it all together to selling the business very successfully a few years ago. So we are going to be risking and rising today with Jonathan as we learn about startup culture, taking risks and coming up with ideas and everything's do really with being an entrepreneur. Enjoy the show. So welcome, Jonathan, to Risk and Rise. To start off with, what comes to mind when you hear that that term, Risk and Rise? Um, I don't know. That uh, makes me think of uh, getting out of bed early and uh, kind of taking on the world and, um, I don't know, doing doing something uncomfortable, I suppose. That's what kind of uh, what makes me think of. It sort of uh, reminds me of um, the years and years of entrepreneurial toil, you know, and, and yeah, getting up early and hitting the hitting the road, uh, you know, getting the hitting the ground running sort of thing in the morning. And you really had some entrepreneurial um, journey or story behind you, and that's what I was excited to to chat to you about because I was around when you first came up with the idea <laughs> of pay fast, mm-hmm. and I remember those early days of asking around. So, so you've come from the idea of a startup working on your own and hiring, I was reading like 130 staff and, you know, with multi-million dollar revenues going through the business and then actually selling it. So I wonder if you could just explain the story just briefly to us and also just highlighting some of the fears that you you had along the way, fears and challenges, I suppose. Sure, that's a uh, well shortish question with a very long answer, but um, you know it's uh, it's a long journey, right? And and yes, you know I remember you know way back in the days when we first met, that was sort of uh, when I was just sort of conceiving of the idea and and sort of uh, yeah, um, you know starting down the long journey. Um, you know, I mean the brief history of Payfast is really just. Um, Kind of having the having the idea, um, getting you know getting in touch with um, you know with uh, with Andy Andy Higgins um, way back in the day, and him and I chatting a bit about about the you know the the, the concept. Um, you know, I ended up working with Andy for a little while um, on on some other projects, but eventually, you know, payments was something that that we saw as being very underserved in the South African market, and kind of just started with a very simple idea and uh, and went from there. Um, and that was really just me and a laptop for a long time, um, you know, with Andy putting in the, the original money just to sort of pay, basically pay my salary for a little while. Um, and then really just started the process of, of building, right? So, um, you, know, th- you know, for me, I'm a, my background is engineering um, and, um, and I can code. And um, so it was really just me and a laptop and a lot of thinking and a lot of coding for a long time. 
and then really just grew the business step by step over quite a long period of time. I mean, I started in May 2007 and, and you know, finally I, I, I left the business in August 2021. So, you know, it's almost 15, 15 years, um, so 14 and a half odd years. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, built the business actually relatively slowly, um, somewhat in line with the growth of, of e-commerce in, in the country. But it was, you know, me and a laptop for a long time and eventually hired employee number one um, only in 2010, actually. So it was quite a way, way into the business. Um, I mean, in terms of life and then really just started growing from there. Right. So you're sure it went from you know, one person to sort of 5, 10, 20, 40, 50, you know, and 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 in the last few years is where it kind of um, really started, uh, you know, growing f- quite fast from, uh, you know, we went from 50 to about 135 um, relatively quickly, um, you know, in, in that sp- period of time. But yeah, that, you know, that's, um, there's, there's a lot that we can talk about in, in that journey, but that was, that was roughly it, right? And just step by step, day by day, solving problems um you know creating a product that clients wanted um sponsoring events with developers all those kind of things in terms of um fears i mean geez there's so many i mean all the way along the 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 journey you know you um and i think it's unfortunately particularly heightened in in fintech businesses um like uh, like payfast where you're dealing with money right and that that comes with its own set of challenges right so you know starting a business is hard at the best of times um starting a business in a highly regulated highly regulated industry is even harder and starting in a highly regulated industry that has to do with people's money that's even harder so it, it, it really is a really tough industry to 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 start a business in um, but it is the one that receives a, a lot of, um, you know, focus funding. You know, fintech is still one of the, the biggest sectors that gets invested into. So I think fears were, yeah, it not working, you know, is, is a simple one. You know, it took a really long time before, you know, before I really felt that um, this was actually something. And even then, you know, I, I didn't necessarily fully believe it. Um, regulation is a, is a, is a massive one. Um straight up fraud risks you know we we dealt with fraud and um you know where people wanted to you know steal money whether it's hackers or or or, or you know fraudsters you know all the time so i mean there are a multitude of, of of fears from from straight up entrepreneurial concerns to to compliance to money to you know everything in between um definitely a, a tough industry to build a business in so did did you fail at all or were there any incidences where Someone else may may have pointed to that and said that's a failure or a big mistake. You know, so not, nothing quite comes to mind in terms of the business. You know, I don't think there was ever like this massive, massive, I mean, failure per se. I mean, there, there, there were always going to be challenges. Uh, you know, I was actually talking about this with someone the other day. You know, we made mistakes. We had times when when the system had downtime or or when we – we had a compliance issue where there was a merchant being serviced who we really shouldn't have been servicing because that slipped through the cracks. So, you know, there's lots of those kind of things that come up. You know, I suppose one of the the more um, telling ones that happened was when we actually had a, a massive system change. Um, I can't remember exactly what year it was now, but uh, I, it was, uh, I think it was a September because it got known as as um, Black September or Black October. I can't actually remember, I think it was September, um, quite a number of years back where, we, we had a massive change in the system. Um, you know, this is a, you know, a system that's 24 7, 365, you know, 99.95% uptime, you know, and, and um, there were massive challenges where, you know, we switched over to this new architecture and it just was not coping and it fell over and payments failed and there was downtime and merchants were upset with us and backlogs, you know, went through the roof. It was a terrible time um, and it was not an easy fix. It took weeks to fix it. Um, you know, so we were sort of limping along in that time and, you know, we had to really try and, and, and battle to get through that. Um, you know, we ended up sending this massive apology letter to all of our merchants and, you know, that we had this photo of the whole team and held up these placards going, you know, we're sorry. Um, you know, so we really had to, to, to sort of work. But, I mean, that authenticity um, really was um, very well received, right? So, so there's sort of instances like that where I can understand that there were – we had challenges, but I wouldn't ever say that they were failures per se. Um, I, yeah, I think you, you're going to you're going to get um, see a lot of these these challenges in doing any business, right? And and I suppose the um, the telling thing is if you can um, overcome those challenges and move forward. 
So what helped you then in overcoming that challenge? What do you think was your inner work that allowed you as the leader to see everyone through that space? Yeah, um, you know, I think for me, I, I have a fairly, I, th I think persistence is something which is key to entrepreneurship, right? Um, you know, sometimes the only reason that we succeed is just because we're doggedly persistent as, as entrepreneurs, right? You know, fa like failure is almost not an option. Um, you know, so I don't, I, I, I think that I, that I always held, you know, held that quite strongly. You know, I have a fairly, you know, relentless work ethic and, and I, I want to solve, uh, I'm a problem solver by nature and, and I kind of won't rest until the problem is solved um, one way or another. And, and I think for me that, that allowed, um, you know, there's a, there's a deep amount of resilience that gets built through, through, um, you know, well, not through these challenges, but just generally um, have a, a fair amount of resilience and, and that helps you through, right? That's personally. Um, and then the other side is just culture and teamwork. I mean, we had such a great team, you know, that was a really challenging time, but it wasn't characterized by any infighting or anything like that. It was characterized by, by an immense amount of um of togetherness and teamwork you know it was um we were all in it together despite the fact that it was fundamentally a failure in terms of our, our development and quality control and all the rest of it um and the people who felt the pain were the customer services team it's not that they there was any you know animosity or anything we we all understood that this was uh, a thing that we were into in together and uh, we needed to work together to get out of it, right? Um, you know, so much so that, you know, our, our our dev team at the time even wrote apology letters to to the customer services guys and said, you know, we're terribly sorry for, <laughs> for the, the pain that we're putting you through and we were working hard to try and fix it, right? So I think it's that that culture is just amazing, right? And, and you know, the saying about culture eats strategy for breakfast, I find to be very true. Um, one has to have good good strategy, but but culture is is fundamental to a well-functioning and successful organization. So if if there was an entrepreneur out there listening to this, what, what tips or advice would you give to them then to try and build that kind of culture? Because that sounds like a culture where they embraced mistakes, owned them, do you know what I mean? were accountable, focused on fixing them. Absolutely right. And look, I don't, I don't think if I have, um, you know, the, the right sort of keywords. I think you mentioned some good words there about accountability and all the rest of it. You know, for us, we just had, you know, a very transparent culture where there was communication. We ensured that everyone knew what was going on. You know, we had, um, you know, so I think communication is probably one if I have to think about it. Communication is key. You know, you need to talk to everyone, let them know what's going on. You don't hide it. You don't make excuses for it. So yes, you take ownership. Um, and you're transparent, you communicate, um, you're authentic, um, and um, yeah, and, and you work as a team. Um, so and that was really what, what, what uh, you know, things I would put forward to, to other entrepreneurs, right? You, you know, we never, we never sat or I never sat in my ivory tower and, 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 and you know, issued edicts from up on high or anything like that. I think it also helps that you know, the business grew from from just me to to a much bigger business, right? So, you know, I still knew uh, every piece of that business and what the job of every person was because largely until, you know, to a point I'd done all of all of that work myself, you know, so I, the, I was not above any of that. You know, we, we, we all... We all knew each other's names. We all, you know, had had drinks together and 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 understood all the, the parts of this business. It wasn't that these people are over there and we're over here, you know. It was uh, th there was uh, it was team. Um, so I think you, you've got and and for me it was an interesting thing to think about as a business grows. How do you maintain that that scale up startup culture? Well, how do you maintain the startup culture in, in a in a scaling business in a growing business? Because I think it is super key. And I think there's some organisations that have done it right to get to thousands of people or you know hundreds of people and still maintain that culture which i think is 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 absolutely um amazing um but those are the things i think i would say you know it's it's uh, communication transparency openness um yeah and so you said they like to maintain that startup culture what how would you describe that like what is the startup culture then even when you're 130 odd people well i think it's that right it's that sort of um you know not having it that oh well this is someone else's problem kind of thing right so so that that ownership mentality is what you want to keep 
Um, and also where you, you know you don't have um, people in executive positions who feel that they are kind of above um, the rest of the organization, right? Or or or, or who sit there and 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 um, you know expect you know others to do something just because they say so, right? Who, who doesn't who, you know where executives don't take feedback, you know. Um, that's kind of what I suppose I'm talking about in terms of uh, of uh, keeping that culture. And the other one is the, is the culture of innovation, right? You know, when organizations get quite big, they get a bit bloated and then people sit around and and they, they can glide by and not necessarily get things done. You know, you want everyone to be invested in the business and engaged and, and, and you want an organization to be innovative um, and there to be teamwork. Uh, you know, so th- there's a lot that you want. And look, I get it. And obviously, as as one gets bigger and bigger, you know, that's going to become more challenging. But I think it's it's something that 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 founders, CEOs, and executives need to strive to to maintain in any business that they build is um, is that kind of um, that kind of culture. So, so one of the the things I've been thinking about, and I'm not, I'm not the only one, but uh, how do how do we find that balance between that innovative culture? Because to be innovative, you actually have to take risks, right? You have to try new things. You have to, you birthing the whole point of innovation that it's it's something new. So how do you balance that with um, people making mistakes? So it's almost like the, the question within this is also how do you, what do you believe about staff making mistakes and, and, at the same time, encouraging them to to take those innovative risks or to bring innovation in. You know, the question is like, how do we balance those two sides? Yeah, I mean, it is a it is a, a tricky one. You know, I've only I mean, actually, I was going to say that I've only really worked in sort of small organisations, but that's not true. I actually have some experience in in, in corporates and larger businesses. I think it's a tough one. Um, and you know, it, it, and it depends. It depends on 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 the kind of businesses one is one is talking to. You. Like smaller businesses, it's a lot easier. Uh, larger businesses, it, it, it's much harder because a larger business is very invested in the way that things are done and its existing revenue streams and all the rest of it, right? Um, so I, I, I frankly think that that very large organisations um, struggle to innovate, and 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 I think it's it's almost impossible for them to do so because the organization itself resists the change. Um, and that's actually people who resist the change. Um, you know, people don't generally like change um, and especially not where they think that that change might cause them some level of job insecurity. So, you know, that's, and I'm talking bigger organizations here, like, you know, hundreds or thousands of people, right? Like a, like a large bank is a, is a, a very case in point where I think large banks struggle to innovate because of the the business itself. Smaller businesses, you shouldn't really have too much problem. You should be able to to, to take a risk on things. Um, although I suppose the, the 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 risk to the business could be higher, right? So I think it's a level where you need to accept that maybe you you risk ten percent or twenty percent of the business in terms of time or money or something like that, right? So it's it's um, you've got to take calculated risks, um, and I think you've got to you've got to be take feedback. And I think that's probably one of the things, you know, whenever, like if we launched a new product or did something new, you take a calculated risk and you, you, you're you not above feedback. You put it out there, you ask people, does this thing work? Does it solve your problem? And if not, give us a fee- give us feedback and then take that feedback and change. You know, you're not a tree, you can move with things. And I think that's the other thing is that people are probably often have an unwillingness to take feedback or accept that they might've been wrong. Um, so I think if you if you if you are willing to accept that you may have been wrong and you are willing to take feedback, then you can iterate, it, you know, and you can change things. It doesn't it doesn't have to stay the same way that you thought was a good idea. So with that, then in terms of being open to to take feedback specifically around us being wrong, what what do you think helps us to to do that? <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I suppose I, I, I make it as a point that I, you know, I probably I struggle sometimes to to take feedback. Um, you know, sometimes when I'm, I know, like I've got a belief, a firm belief that that I'm that I'm right. Um, you know, so it, it's you know, I think we all struggle with that. Um, I think this is part of what I like about business and 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 capitalism to a large degree is that. You know, you may think you're right, uh, but the market will tell you whether you're right or not, right? This is the thing about, you know, the saying, vote with your feet, um, you know, and um, 
if you think you're right, you put something out there, no one's willing to pay for it, then you're obviously wrong. The market is telling you you're wrong. So it's quite clear when when you get it right. Um, so, you know, and in this instance, it's it's in your interest to take the feedback, even if that feedback is telling you something different than what you thought. You know, I mean, the number one reason that, that startups fail is building a product that no one wants. Um, you know, so you you really need to be able to to take that feedback, and it's in your interest to take that feedback. So I think that's yeah, it's the joy about business. It, it, you, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't resist what the market is telling you, um, and to resist what the market is telling you would be stupid because it's not in your own interest. So you know, I don't I don't think there's there's a massive secret there. It's I suppose it is don't be so doggedly persistent on something where the market is telling you that you're incorrect. Um, you know, that would be unwise on all counts. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a very specific type of feedback that is, I don't know, it's, it's so black and white almost. <laughs> yeah, look, it's, it's hard when, when you're maybe not in a, in a for-profit environment, but if you are building a business to make money, which most people are, you know, the feedback is very clear, um, is that people are willing to pay for what you are selling them, what you are, what you are doing. You know, if you're in a, in, in, in like a non-profit environment, that's a lot harder. And that's actually, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's a much harder thing to know what the right thing to do is because you it doesn't pass uh, a market test. So so that's like the, the feedback in terms of your bottom line and that, but in terms of then creating that culture, because what I'm, I'm hearing from you, what it sounds like, and I think a lot of us, when we're in it and we just do it naturally, we're not always aware of how we do it. But from what I'm hearing is, is your openness to be, you know, transparent? Let's talk about it. What mm -hmm. you know, being willing to hear the the information and deal with it, to make the changes, and the teamwork. We're all in this together, and um, I Look, really like, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it's the same sort of thing, you know, where you you've got to have again, it depending on your team size, right? I mean, you know, because whoever's listening to this might have a team of one or a team of a hundred, you know, anywhere between, but. The same is true internally, right? I mean, you do, you know, if you have a number of people in your business, you do need to have a fairly decently defined performance management approach, right? Where And part of that is that you you have conversations with your people on a regular basis or management, whoever is that their, their team manager does. And in that, you know, we, 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 we evolved this over time. But everyone in the business would have conversations about their career and feedback and all the rest of it on a regular basis, you know, and that's the same as 360. It's up and down. It's not just from the top down. It's from the bottom up as well. Right. So everyone would be able to talk about the business and about their manager and, and the other way. So feedback was both ways. Right. So that's the same, the same thing, right. Within the business, you, there is a lot of conversation around that. So, and yes, and taking that feedback sometimes can be tough, but, you know, let's say the typical example, like I would, you know, I would talk to, to, to my, you know, the sort of direct reports who would be the, the heads of various departments, uh, you know, once the business was big enough. Um, but then I would also ask for their subordinates feedback on them, you know, so you, you, you get a full thing and then they would give me feedback as well, right? It's the same deal. Um, so the, the feedback's got to be both ways. It's not just you as boss going downwards, you need to be willing to to accept the feedback coming up. And, and the same is true at any level of an organization, right? Um, so yeah, and I think that's a bit harder. It's a bit harder for people to maybe hear things about themselves that they that they don't want to hear. Um, but, um, but but be that as it may, you need to be uh, that 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 I think needs to be in place. And and having a, a very good sort of performance management um, and uh, and feedback culture is 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 really good for an organization. Yeah, and I was just going to add from from my experience around helping people become what I call risk fit, <laughs> and is feedback as a part of it is not taking it personally. Understanding the feedback is just about your doing part instead of your being, and hopefully that you know you can teach the skill of how do we give that feedback, that we can give it about the person's doing and not make it personal, so it's easier to to hear, but also if there is not that skill there's a skill in the individual that we can learn to not take it personally and just sift through all that information to find what's useful so that you can improve. Because that's the bottom line, right, about feedback is, and there's a saying there's no such thing as failure, it's only feedback. 
is we want information so that we can do better the next time. Absolutely. And I think it's something that one actually um, has to practice at, um, you know, so the more you do it, the better you become at it, right? Um, and so I think the first time you do any of this, it, it's, it's, it's more difficult, but as you do it more frequently, it becomes a lot easier. And then, you know, conversations can just naturally be more open and more genuine, uh, you know, more authentic. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like anything, practice, not practice makes perfect, because I don't think it's ever going to be perfect, but it is practice makes perfect. Well, yeah, the, the replacement is practice makes progress. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's something that I had to, I had to, you know, it's slightly different, but um, I had to sort of internalize myself because I'm quite a perfectionist, is that uh, perfection, progress over perfection. You know, perfection is the enemy of progress. That's um, something I really had to to get right. And there's a few other sayings, this done is better than perfect, you know. Um, so, yeah, it, it's definitely progress is what you should aim for, not perfection. And so what helped you then to overcome that? Because I think that is part of failure is we, sometimes we project that we want it to be perfect. So therefore we're so scared of it failing that we don't even start. I mean, but links to procrastination, but I'm off track there. Yeah, look, what I, what I, helped I, you with all that? I'm an I'm absolute culprit of that through and through. Um, I, I, you know, I think for me, just really uh, what it was is becoming – absolutely and chronically overworked um and so i just got to the point that it was like i cannot do this i am a blocker um to something like you know stuff would go to my my email inbox to die and stay there for for months you know i was terrible at delegating absolutely a perfectionist um wanted to be involved in 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 in, in or handle certain things and um, yeah, I just got you know massively overworked and stuff just wasn't getting done. So I suppose I just got to that sort of not quite breaking point, but that point where I'm just going, I I need to give this to someone else because if I it's not getting done at the moment. It's been sitting waiting on me for months now. Like this is pointless. Like this needs to go to someone else. And even if it's fifty percent done the way that I wanted it done, at least it's fifty percent rather than zero, which it is right now. So I think for me it was just a purely a function of 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 just not getting to things. So literally them not being done versus um versus half done or 80% done or whatever. And um and then you know what happens is you 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 delegate, you ask someone to help, you 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 give it to someone else and you actually get pleasantly surprised. Hopefully you get pleasantly surprised um that it gets done and it gets done pretty well actually. Um, and that look, I mean, that's a function of hiring good people. But um, but yeah, I mean, that for me was 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 you know life changing. And then you you become, I suppose, it, it, it was different for, difficult for me because I become through doing everything rather than than delegating. Like I don't don't quite, you know, I'm not that great at telling people what to do. It's not, you know, I sort of had to learn how to do that rather than and coach them and help them and guide them. That becomes your job as a as a as an entrepreneur as a CEO over time. Um, but that's not where you start. So it's kind of hard to do, do that sort of gear change. Um, so that, that's just to practice um, and and also hiring some good people. Um, yeah, so there was just really a function of, of growth. It was not a specific thing besides just being very overworked. Yeah, so it's almost like it forced you to to gain the learnings. From absolutely, me. absolutely forced. Um, yeah. yeah, and, and that's another thing I suppose. Maybe and maybe this is true of most entrepreneurs, but asking for help is 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 a is a tough thing. Um, you know, and I remember getting to the point where I, I needed to ask for help um, because there's just no way, and um, and that was a hard thing to do, but it turned out to be a really good thing. Cool. So, yeah, lots of learnings then on your entrepreneurial journey of. Um, through pay fast and that. So is there anything else that you can recommend to those aspiring entrepreneurs to to how, how they can balance that need to take the risk and also with manage their fear of failure and their fears, especially when they're starting out? Look, I think the um I think you know the, the feedback that I I haven't sort of been been in these events too much, but you know, I used to talk quite a bit at entrepreneurial events and started to do it a bit more now. But um, my feedback then was always just start. You know, that's that's kind of the the the, the biggest step you can take is just start. And it doesn't have to be this big bang, it doesn't have to be perfect at all. You know, what's more important is the progress, as we've said now, is is just starting. And 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 whatever it happens to be, you know, these things 
you, you can start small. You can start in a, in, a, in a really tiny way. Maybe you have an, you know, an existing job and, and you, yeah, you need, to, you want to spend a bit of time as a side hustle doing something in the evenings or weekends. Do that. Like just start. Like it, it doesn't have to be this monumental, perfect business plan, get the funding, all the rest of it. You know, it's more important that you just do something. Um, you know, when I was, um, first working, I was, um, spending time in my evenings and weekends busy um, building a website for something that I, that, I, that I wanted to try, which eventually actually became a business, not pay fast, but something, something else. Um, you know, and that's the other thing. I think people also, they, they sort of have this thing like, oh, we're, 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 you know, I don't have the time, which I mean, largely is just an excuse. You definitely have the time, but you choose to spend the time in certain ways. You know, and I think if you if you believe enough in in, in what you want to do or, or yourself, you will find the time. You will not watch that series, or don't go for that that beer, or don't um, you know whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, I, I worked a you know full uh, fairly long day when when I used to work for Accenture, and, and I would come home in the evenings, have dinner, and then spend two or three hours in the evening busy coding up this this website, and sometime on the weekends. You know, so you have that eight, ten more hours a week that you can you can do something. Um, and that's that's the important thing is just start. And I know you you actually started with not much knowledge or you know in in payments and that, which I also find interesting. But you you wanted to to you had this urge to do something <laughs> entrepreneurial. Yeah, I mean, and you just of, started. You just like started developing the knowledge that you needed. Yeah, totally. I mean, in terms of that backstory, yeah, for me, you know, I I always wanted to to start a business. That was something that was just in me from 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 a young age. Um, you know, and I had this quite specific idea that I'd spend two years more more um, technical, two years more management. So I worked for just short of four years before I um, I started um, going down my entrepreneurial journey, and I actually left with no clear idea of what I was going to do. Um, you know, I, I had a bit of money, a bit of savings. I moved back in with the parents just to save some money there and and uh, and started. And there was a few different bits and pieces there and before I eventually settled on on the payments world. Um, but absolutely, I, I didn't, you know, I, I, I was, I, I, the internet was, was something, you know, what I wanted to have the business around. But there are many different ideas in that, but, but all of them needed payment. So that was the sort of underserved one. And absolutely, I didn't know anything about the payments world. Um, and really just, Took took a step uh, with a little bit of a um, little bit of knowledge um, gained about the market at the time, and and just progressively started working at it and solving the problems that came up, and that eventually became a very successful business. Great, yeah. No way. So let's talk about in the context of South Africa, but because I think the, there's a lot of fear of failing within our culture. There's this. Um, we don't, I think within ourselves, there's an aspect of, you know, we ourselves have to overcome our own fear and what it would mean if we were to fail, in inverted commas, you know, what, what would other people say to us? There's a, there's a lot of scared of, of being judged, what others would say. And also then, you know, that the, the flip side is, is as a culture, how could we support more people to be more entrepreneurial, to I don't know. So my, my question is again, what's happening for you from your experience within the South African context around us encouraging more startups? Because I think it's key to the economy, to creating jobs, you know, all of that good stuff that comes from people like you. I mean, you've <laughs> created a job that hired 130 plus people. Um, create not a job, you created a business that did that. Yeah, so look, I um, I mean, I, I, I agree in, in one way. I mean, I don't know if I have enough data points to maybe talk you know, fully on this, but I, I, my, my sense is that um, we as South Africans don't think big enough. Um, that's kind of what I've, I've taken away. And I suppose that is to some degree uh, fear of failure and all the rest of it. Look, I mean, Admittedly, we have a country that has a lot of problems, right? The you know the highest difference between the rich and the poor, you know, highest Gini coefficient in the world, um, you know, sitting with unemployment that sits officially and unofficially in what 30, 40 odd percent, you know, poverty is a real challenge, right? So we we have a lot of of, of issues as a country, and, and the reason why I mention that is that 
there probably isn't much of a safety net, right? So, so failure has legitimate consequences. You know, it, it's it's not an easy thing. Whereas, you know, some more developed markets, you can try something and you're not you're not risking the shirt on your back, right? So, it is it is a tough thing. Um, but on the converse, I suppose if you if you don't have a lot, you don't have a lot to lose. Um, so, you know, starting something when you are are younger is easier. Um, but statistically, they've actually shown that the people who are most successful who start businesses in their in their early to mid forties. So, you know, it it um, it, it does. It, there's, a, there's a broad range. It's never never a long time to uh, to try and start something. Um, in terms of 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 of, of our ecosystem, South Africa as startup. You know, I've seen a lot of startups. You know, I'm in, I'm investing in in businesses these days as an angel investor. And you know, I see a lot that comes across my desk, and I'm I'm going to more of these events again now. And so I'm quite um, happy and and proud and and excited about what I see coming out of coming out of South Africa. And I think a lot of people are are trying. Um, and sure, in the last little while, there's been a bit less risk capital um, than the last few years, but but it's still there, you know. And I think I think that I always say to people is that there's not there's not a lack of funding or money actually to support. Um, entrepreneurs and founders. What there are is a lack of quality entrepreneurs. That's that what there is a lack of. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think. I think if you've, you know, the, there's um, if you've got a good concept and you've put in some time and effort to actually flesh it out or or actually build something, there's definitely capital available, right? And so I'm I'm not sure that that failure is necessarily. Um, such a challenge necessarily. I think that if if you <coughs> have it, a good enough idea, or you have something you believe, um, put the effort in um, and um, and flesh it out, or put the work in, or learn about an industry, or learn how to code, or whatever it happens to be, or start the retail store. It, it's become so much easier to start now. But what what people are not going to do is abs- is 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 um, handhold you. To do this, you've got to take the first step, and you've got to take a little bit of a of a personal risk, and that doesn't have to be a massive risk. It's just going to be a bit of risk of your time. That's it, you know. Um, that that yeah, and that 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 to me is, is sort of commentary on that. But I do think that we as South Africans don't necessarily think big enough, um, and I think that's something we need to work. We need to work to to change, and that's it's a, like a winning mentality. I don't think we have a winning mentality. I think we've we've had a lot of uh, kind of pain and challenges internally to deal with as a culture. And I think also there's there's something about where we sit in the world, you know, the southern tip of Africa, we're quite far away from from the rest of the world to some degree. Um, you know, we, we are surrounded by a lot of bad news and that, that doesn't help, you know, one's mindset. Um, but we really are sitting in, you know, a good time zone. We have, you know, a relatively decent cost of living, um, you know, in South Africa. We're, we're in a good place to service like the European market um, or even just building a really good business in, in South Africa, right? So I think there is a lot of opportunity. Um, and uh, whereas, you know, the, the, the one of the things which was really good, uh, it's good for, for Payfast, but just good in general is that it's not as competitive in, in South Africa to build these things as it is potentially in the rest of the world. You know, you go and try and start a, a new payments business in America, even when I did a number of years ago, really hard because it's a massively competitive environment, not as competitive in South Africa. Um, so, you know, there, there are pros and cons. It's, it's very interesting. So so you said there that we don't really have a winning mentality, which is it's fun because I'm actually reading a book all about that. So I can't wait to finish that book and hopefully get the authors on, on risk and rise. Um, because I did see in that book, that whole winning versus losing mentality. I can see it playing out in South Africa in what's happening in our mm-hmm. socioeconomic, you know, challenges and that. So, so if we, you know, you're coming up now, you've, you've moved out of pay fast. Um, I'm not actually sure what you're doing now other than, an angel investor so maybe you can just let us know you know what's on your future plans but also i just want to ask then about from that perspective of someone who invests in businesses and we need more people south africans to think bigger because my question is not only in terms of our own personal journey in, in developing ourselves to handle risk and and our develop our mindsets but as a society how could we support those people that are putting up their hands, how do we support them to think bigger, to 
to get over the the losing mentality and develop more of a winning one? Um, <laughs> let me let me speak to that first, and I'll talk about kind of what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I think yeah, it, it's uh, you know the, I, it, when you talk about that, I'm reminded of of. Um, something that someone said, I almost, I can't remember if it was Elon Musk or someone along those lines who was talking about how, you know, you, you should have a, like a new business shower, you know, where um, it's like a baby shower concept where if someone starts a business that everyone gets together and celebrates it and, and offers to help them in some way to support the journey, right? Like gives them an hour of their time as an accountant or something like that, you know, because everyone's very supportive of, of the birth of a new human being, but but people are not as supportive yes. of the birth of a new business, right? And 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 it would be good to get that kind of culture going. Um, yeah, look, it's a tough, it's a tough one. I don't, I think it's quite hard for, you know, the general population to be super supportive of businesses because it's something that's a bit foreign to them, right? You know, it's it's um, it's not people can't necessarily understand it, right? Even in my own journey, you know, sometimes the the people that are the closest to you and that love you the most are actually sometimes the worst to have around you because they, they can see you suffering or see you um, really working hard at something and not getting the return because entrepreneurship is hard and it, it takes time. Um, and they are like, oh, maybe you should just go get a job, you know. So so they're quite quite tough to have around, actually. Um, so it, it, is, it is a hard thing. I think what my advice in this regard to um, entrepreneurs is find an entrepreneur organization to be part of. Um, you know, and there are a number of these around because you need to talk to other entrepreneurs. You can't, it, it, you know, most people who who, who work for a, live, for a living with a salary or a, a, a company in Boston, that's fine, are not going to have the, the, the same context. They're not going to be able to, to really understand your journey. Um, but there are other entrepreneurs. I guarantee you have the same challenges, the same thoughts, the same fears. Um, I was not good at doing that. Um, and it was a mistake that I made. Um, so whether it's... Um, you know, EO, entrepreneurs organization, or it's a local small business forum, or it's um, wh whatever, there are a number of these organizations, um, I would highly recommend, you know, become part of part of those. Um, and, and as you sort of grow as an entrepreneur, you know, that'll scale up because some of these, these company, these organizations do have entry requirements, you know, businesses have to be a certain size. And that's just trying to make sure that they align, you know, the entrepreneurs so that they have similar issues that they're, that they're, um, they're dealing with. But I would uh, I would highly recommend that, even if it's yeah other people you know uh, who you find a business who who are starting out um, businesses uh, you know go and talk to them. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's what I would say about that is I don't think one can ever really get a a a, a very mass culture that's very supportive of it, but but you can find people within you know your your uh, your nearest circles who who can be supportive and are going through some of the journey. Um, in terms of what I'm doing, um, yeah, look, uh, so I, as I said, I left in about, uh, well, not about, August 21. Um, I was dealing with a bit of personal stuff at the end of that year and, and 2022. But then really last year, so 2023, I started down the, the road of being an, an angel investor. Um, and that's kept me pretty busy for the last for the last year. So I've invested in a, in a number of different businesses, both locally, internationally. Um, and that's, yeah, it's very interesting. And it's interesting to see um you know the, the businesses that are coming up um and uh, yeah i love the kind of entrepreneurs who who are uh, and and the ideas that they're pursuing um so that keeps me fairly busy um also just sort of i'm interested you know it's an interesting time and just in terms of geopolitics and financial markets so i spend a bit of time around economics um and sort of general investing which which is um which i find quite quite interesting um I do have a little bit of an interest in, in the wine industry, which which kept me busy for a little bit of the time, um, but not so much at the moment. But that kept me um, that kept me a bit busy last year. Um, and then now I'm starting to look at at you know one or two things that I'm interested in taking a more um, sizable position in, or or a bigger investment in certain businesses and getting a little bit more involved, a little bit more hands on again. Um, but that's to be you know to be confirmed it's nothing, nothing concrete yet but um you know you start talking about enough ideas with people and having enough conversations you know some of them start sparking a bit more interest than than others great and if anyone wants to get hold of you or, or follow that journey what's the best way i suppose the easiest is really linkedin these days that's kind of um you know you just search for search for my name and it'll be up there jonathan smith 
um, yeah, I don't have a, really a website or anything I can refer to anyone to these days. So that's kind of my uh, my my go to, right? Um, so yeah, LinkedIn, um, and then Jonathan Smith, and you should find me there. Great. Well, to to come into the end now, I've got a few rapid fire questions. If you're open to the fun of it, <laughs> sure, hit me with it. What comes to mind when I say failure? Uh, I suppose a mixture of just being straight up the word is like business failure, right? So I suppose running out of money, building a product that that, that someone doesn't want, but in, in to some degree, then also it triggers me personally uh, in terms of 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 feeling feeling like you haven't made it or whatnot as a person. Uh, so I think that that hits me um, personally when I hear failure. Yeah. What is your secret weapon for bouncing back from a setback? Yeah, I think uh, just uh, stubborn persistence um, and and resilience. Um, there's no secret to that. It's just, um, yeah, you've got to dig deep. Um, and I think I've just been not lucky, but worked at that over, over much time, just because you have the end goal in sight. And you know that whatever happens, you it's not the end. You're working towards something bigger. What's the most important lesson you've learned as an entrepreneur? Hmm. I think it's around people. Um, yeah, I, you know, I initial stages of the business was built a lot on my own work and and how I could do things, and but but over time you become a manager of people um, and having hiring well and having really good people on your team is just life changing um, and working with people towards a common goal. Uh, I think that lesson was um, of sort of hire good people sooner than you think you need them. What is the best advice you've ever received as an entrepreneur? I think whenever I was faced with a really big challenge or um, something that went wrong, um, you know, the advice that I that I received as well, this is one more hurdle that someone else would have to go through for this this business or this journey, right? So, so every time you face with a challenge, it's actually a good thing because it's a challenge that someone else would have to go through as well, right? So it actually builds more value. So I think. Any time I got faced with some adversity, I viewed it as, as an opportunity to build a more valuable business, which um, yeah, just reframed it just reframed any um, hardship that I went through, which was incredibly helpful. And last one, what inspires you to get out of bed in the morning? Hmm. Um, I like building, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer and, and, and I like building things. I like solving problems. And I think that that, that, that it just inspires me kind of on a daily basis, both in my personal life and in, in any business life, right? So, you know, at the moment, while I'm not necessarily building directly at the moment, I am helping others who are building and solving problems. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 lo I love that. It's, I think it's just amazing to be able to see something that doesn't, that, that, that works in a way you don't think is right in the world as an entrepreneur or as someone who's supporting entrepreneurs and actually going and doing something about it. You know, it's, um, you know, not being a passive bystander or going, well, this is the way and I can't change it and going, well, this is the way, but it's not the good way and we can change it and doing something about it. I think that's just, it's, it's fun. Business is fun. Solving problems is, 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 is fun and building something of value is, is fun. I find business incredibly inspiring, incredibly, um, Fulfilling. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, just then, is there one last parting thought or bit of advice that you would give to someone who's listening to this but maybe struggling with that fear of failure and hesitating to take that leap into entrepreneurship? I think just to reiterate what we said before is um, don't, don't worry about it being perfect and just start. It doesn't matter how small the step is that you take. Um, just start whether that's 
writing an email, jotting something down on a piece of paper, re- registering a business, opening a bank account. You know, these things are, are it's, it's a lot of admin, but they're actually relatively easy to do these days. Um, and it doesn't have to be polished. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just start. You'll figure, you, you'll, you'll learn more by doing than you ever will by overthinking. Ah, that's powerful. Thank you, Jonathan. Cool, my pleasure. And uh, I hope uh, the, the, the audience for this um, finds something useful about uh, out of this conversation. This has been Risk and Rise with me, Talana Simpson. Thank you for listening and I hope that you enjoyed the show. And please do follow the show, Risk and Rise, on your favorite podcast app. It really will help us to spread the news and to um, interview more exciting people just like Jonathan so that we can learn from them and develop more of that winning mindset so that we can all go out and make a difference in this world as we risk and rise together. Thank you for joining me on Risk and Rise, where we face fears, conquer challenges, and rise above adversity to achieve our dreams. Find out more at riskandrise.co.za.